Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to OpEd.TV. There were times in America when politics and government seemed a lot less crazy and chaotic than they are today. It would be hard to make the case that those were better times. There were terrible wars and a depression and a lot more racism and misogyny than we see today. But throughout much of those times, Americans could feel that their country stood for something good and positive, and that despite the myriad problems, we were on our way to a better future. My guest has written a wonderful book that chronicles those times via the life of a man who played an outsized role in politics, government, big business, and even Hollywood. The book is The Patriarch, The Remarkable Life and Turbulent Times of Joseph P. Kennedy. And the author is David Nassau, a distinguished professor of history right here at the CUNY Graduate Center. David, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. So uh, for those who may not know, Joseph P. Kennedy was the father of President John F. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Teddy Kennedy, and their numerous siblings. And we will get into the family a bit more in a, in a few minutes. But one of the things that stands out in your book, one of many things, is how serious the major political leaders were at one time in their approach to public matters. I mean, their willingness to study and understand um, the issues, and as you had mentioned in another context, their sense of moral purpose. Um, that's a real contrast, it seems to me, uh, with what we see as the political, political discourse uh, today. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think Politics today has become almost a sporting game where there's a winner and a loser. And you have to make snap decisions and based on whether you're going to be the winner or the loser. Politics 40 years ago, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, was a more serious and more dedicated profession. Mm -hmm. Of course there were idiots, there were charlatans, there were scoundrels. No question. But the people who got to the top, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, they worked hard and they had right. a sort of a moral bearing. They wanted to make the city, the state, the nation a better place after their term of office than it had been before. When I first became aware of Joe Kennedy was when Jack Kennedy was running for president in 1960. And that's when the Kennedy family burst on the scene. And they were glamorous, they were beautiful, they were charismatic and that sort of thing. And Joe was kind of lurking in the background. Almost it seemed like kind of an ogreish figure. You read your book and you find out that the Joe Kennedy for most of his life was really nothing like that, that he was this dynamic, charismatic uh, figure. So can you talk a little bit about the Joe Kennedy that was for most of his life and the Joe Kennedy that seemed to be lurking in the background and had this ogreish way about him in the early 1960s? Uh, Ted Kennedy, when, when I was doing my research uh, for this, told me that his father had the capacity to walk into a room and whoever was there, whether it was cardinals of the church, whether it was big businessmen, whether it was political <laughs> leaders, whether it was statesmen from European nations, he would become the center of attention. Wow. He had a charisma, he had a concentration, he had an intelligence, he had a wit, he had a bearing, he was tall with perfect, perfect <laughs> posture. He had a smile that would light up a room. And he had a ruthless sense of purpose. <laughs> when he walked into the right. room, the room would light up. 
when he would walk out, he would become somewhat of a different person. Uh, he succeeded in everything he did, mm -hmm. everything, except baseball. He wanted to be a star <laughs> on the Harvard baseball team and couldn't hit a curveball and was too slow. But once he got over that in business, in politics, not as an elected official, right. but as a man behind the scenes, uh, everything he wanted to do, he got done. Now, one of the myths yeah. that you burst yeah. was the idea that Joe Kennedy was a bootlegger and that that's how he made uh, most of his money. Um, he was not a bootlegger, I found out yeah. <laughs> reading, reading your book, but he was one of the richest men in America. How did he make his money? He made his money by buying, selling, manipulating stocks. He was a genius right. at it. When he went out to Hollywood, we, you know, this is an overlooked part of, his, part of his life. He went to Hollywood. He ran two or three or four of the major studios out there. And he demanded to be paid in stock options and expense accounts. He'd get big expense accounts, a reasonable salary, and huge stock options, which he drove the price of those stocks up and down and sideways <laughs> and, and made a fortune out of it. Right. When he became, Roosevelt named him as the first chairman of the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Committee, uh, commission to regulate the stock market. Why? Because after the crash, Americans weren't putting money in the stock market. If they don't put money into the stock market, the economy can't move forward. So he puts Joe, Kennedy as the chairman of the SEC. And what does Joe do? He outlaws every one of the <laughs> tricks and gimmicks he had used to make a gazillion right. dollars and from the mid-30s on moves his money out of the stock market into real estate. One of the biggest things, maybe the, the, the biggest thing about Joe Kennedy that came across to me from the book, um, was the intensity of his love for his family and especially for his children. It, it, it seemed like even with all the success he had and everything that he was so good at, it all eventually would come back to his kids. That was the thing it, it seemed to me that he lived for. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, when I began work on this book, I interviewed the children who were alive at the time in large part, Eunice and Gene Kennedy and, and Ted, and they all went overboard with praise and love for their father. And I didn't get it. I thought, they're, they're feeding me something. <laughs> and then as I did my research, right. and as I looked at the letters back and forth in the interviews, it was true. Joe, for Joe Kennedy, family came first. Every dollar he earned, he earned so that his children wouldn't have to work. His notion was, I'm gonna become a millionaire, I'm gonna put that money into trust funds, and my children can go into public service. Right. My children will not have to earn money. They can do better than me in terms of serving the public. And that sense of public service Tuck, um, these kids, even the ones who were not as famous as Jack or Bobby or, or Ted, um, they devoted um, large segments of their lives to one form of public service or, or, or another. It's, it, it's absolutely remarkable. You look at every other political dynasty, um, everyone, Roosevelt's, Bush's, wherever you want to look, the children go into business. They use the connections they've made to make their own fortunes. Not the Kennedys. Right. Not the Kennedys. Every one of the children, the males and the females, go into some form of public service, and that carries over into the next generation. Um, it's, it's remarkable, and that comes from Joe. Now, the, the dark cloud over the life of, of Joe Kennedy was um, the anti-Semitism 
um, his willingness to appease um, Hitler, um, especially when he was the ambassador to the court of St. James in the, in the years leading up to wo World War II. His defeatism, even during the war, it, it seems to me. And it struck me as odd, out of character for this guy who had such a can-do spirit, who in so many ways had been so optimistic, believed in himself and that sort of thing. What's your take on that? Where, where did all of that come from? Yeah. I think Kennedy was a realist. And when he went to Europe as ambassador to the court of St. James, a brilliant move by Roosevelt to send an Irishman to <laughs> represent the United States in London, he had a sense that the British were an old, desiccated nation of people who had lost their verve, their vitality. And the Germans were on the move. And he was absolutely convinced that in a war between Germany and Great Britain, the Germans would win easily. Now, he was right, of course. Right. Uh, but the he Germans not... lost because the Soviets came into the war. Right. And Kennedy didn't see that. Kennedy did not want a world war in which the British were defeated. He did not want a world war in which the Americans had to come in to protect and to save the British. Because he figured one way or another, whether America lost or won, and he was pretty convinced it would win in the long run, the economy would be destroyed. And everything he had struggled for would be lost. But more than that, more than that, American democracy, he believed, rested on a safe, secure, and just capitalism. And, and if that capitalism was lost or undermined, fascism or something similar would result. You gotta, you gotta look at the world in 1930. Right. Um, Italy, Spain, Germany, Soviet Union, most of Eastern Europe had gone fascist. There was a strong right-wing movement in France, and there was Mosley in, in Great Britain. And what goes first, Kennedy believes, is the economy. The government moves in to regulate the economy in war, and that is the first step away from democracy and towards some form of fascism. And Kennedy was convinced that that was the way this country was going to go. You can't talk about the Kennedys without talking about the terrible tragedies that befell that family. So, um, and even if you've lived through all the news, it's still astounding when you, when you look back on it. So talk uh, a little bit isn't about it? that. Well, let me, let me answer the, the question I didn't answer, you, you right. asked, and then I'll, I'll go into that. The anti-Semitism question. Right. In doing this work about an Irish Catholic from Boston who ends up in Washington, the question that I believed had to be answered was not, was Joe Kennedy an anti-Semite, but what kind of an anti-Semite was he? It was one of the more distressing lessons I learned in looking at what went on in Washington, particularly in the State Department. And in this nation, prior to, leading up to World War II and immediately afterwards, anti-Semitism was in the air. It was in the environment. It was the person who was not an anti-Semite in Washington was, was the exception. Joe Kennedy was not one of those exceptions. He was not a virulent, you know, Father Coughlin right. anti-Semite. But he believed that the Jews were a different race of people with different qualities. And one had to look out for them because they were not, their first loyalty was not to the United States of America. That tainted, of course, his entire career going forward. Um, he, he became known 
um, uh, if not primarily for the anti-Semitism, he certainly became known as an appeaser, which is uh, in post World War II period was a terrible well, thing to have been. Although you make it clear in your book that in the initial stages of the appeasement of Hitler, how many of the heads of states were happy with the with Chamberlain and, and the, the appeasing that was going on? Yeah, nobody wanted. Right. There had just been a world war, the most vicious war in, that Europe had ever seen. Right. And that war was over in 1918, and now we're in 1938. 20 years later, 1939, nobody wanted a war. And nobody wanted a war with Hitler, allied with Mussolini and maybe Franco, and who knew where Stalin was gonna go. Right. I mean, no one wanted a war. And Kennedy was only one of those who tried to find a way out of the war. Kennedy was not in the minority. What happens is that when it becomes clear that you can't make a deal with Hitler, Right. that this is a madman, Kennedy continues to insist because Kennedy is a businessman and a man who's made deals. He says, leave it to me. I'll make a deal with Hitler. So um, talk a little bit about the terrible sequence of tragedies oh, the, that befell the Kennedys. Yeah, the, the curse of the Kennedys. Um, you know, after doing all this work and and meeting Kennedys, and I've come to the conclusion that they sort of think they're invincible there. Right. You know, that, that nothing can destroy them. That if you look at the, some of the deaths, um, they were avoidable. Joe Kennedy Jr. Right. didn't have to get and volunteer for a bomber run across the English Channel at the end of the war in a campaign that was bound to end in him being blown up. Yeah, and, and he, he, was in a, he was in a plane. The plane was overloaded with explosives. <laughs> he was supposed to fly the plane, bail out before the plane landed and exploded. Well, it exploded right. while he was still in it. Right. Uh, his sister, Kick, Kathleen, Kathleen right. got into a plane with her boyfriend in a terrible storm when the pilot said, I don't want to fly in France. Right. John John Kennedy yep. flew, where did he fly? To Hyannisport, yeah. right? From with, with, with his wife and his sister-in-law. I always think about the, the poor family who lost both of their daughters oh, in, in that crash. And yeah. again, he, he was... He took risks that he didn't have to take. So, so they have this feeling that they're, that they're golden, right. that they're immortal, right. and, and they take these dreadful risks. Now, there are other things that they, could, that they couldn't help. Um, Rosemary. Rosemary. Talk about Rosemary a little bit. Rosemary is a, is a sad, sad story. She and was the oldest Joe daughter, Kennedy, wasn't she? She was the oldest daughter. She was the third oldest child. She was born probably because it was a delayed delivery um, with a level of retardation, which meant she would never develop uh, intellectual skills above that of a five-year-old. Right, in this very dynamic family. In the, it, well, she couldn't. As long as the, her brothers and sisters were around, she didn't understand what she couldn't do. Mm -hmm because they would play tennis with her, they would take her sailing, they would take her to school dances. They loved this woman. But as the kids got older right. and left the house, she was left alone. Right. And she began to understand. She put on weight. She became sort of large and dumpy looking, unlike the svelte Kennedys. And she couldn't go out. Right. She had no boyfriend, she had no friends. She couldn't go for a walk. She couldn't go sailing. Uh, so this Joe, wonderful woman, you know, young woman became angrier and angrier and angrier. And Joe, who always sought out the best medical advice, went to the doctors. And the doctor said, you've got the perfect thing. It's called the lobotomy. 
We're not going to make her improve the retardation, but she'll be happy for the rest of her life. She won't have the same sense of anger about she her. She won't have anxieties. Mm -hmm. She won't have fears. She won't have this anger. And Joe went to Johns Hopkins with a Yale-trained neurosurgeon, and they did the operation, and it was a disaster, mm. an absolute disaster. But again, so she was then institutionalized. She was institutionalized. For the rest of her life. But if there's a villain here, it's not Joe Kennedy. Right. Why didn't Joe consult Rose? Because all of the textbooks, the guidebooks, everybody at the time said women can't be trusted to make life and death decisions about their children. Right. Women are sentimental and emotional. Right. The guy has to make the decision. We only have a couple of minutes left, and I'd like to touch on the issue of uh, Jack running for um, president. He's the first, um, well, he became ultimately the first Catholic president. He wasn't the first Catholic to run for president. But uh, when he ran, the family and, and, and Joe especially believed um, they, they understood that there would be a certain amount of anti-Catholic uh, prejudice uh, against this candidacy, but they also believed that there would be um, this tremendous pride among Catholics and that, that would drive up uh, the turnout among Catholics. What actually happened? The, the Catholic Church, headed by Cardinal Francis Spellman of New York, was unalterably opposed to Kennedy run. <laughs> they believed that the worst thing that could happen to the church was that this striking, young, handsome man would become the most famous Catholic in the country, number one. Number two, they knew that a Catholic president couldn't pursue their main aim at the time, which was funding for Catholic schools. Right. Um, and they were violently, vehemently anti-communist. Kennedy was anti-communist, but not as anti-communist as Richard Milhouse <laughs> right. Nixon. So, so the, the church did everything it could to push the Nixon candidacy. Um, wow. It was a disaster. Joe Kennedy was incensed. Right. He cut off all relationships with the church. He never saw Spellman again. He never gave money to the church. And for Kennedy, the greatest disappointment in his life, he knew that he was not going to be president right. because he was an Irish Catholic. And he had wanted Joe to become president. Joe Jr. Joe, had been, Joe Jr. had been killed. Right. Now Jack runs for president, and Kennedy believes that there'll be pushback, anti Catholic feeling, but never to the extent that there was. Right. When the election is over, the reporters all look at Joe Kennedy and they say, why isn't this man smiling? Right. He wasn't smiling because his son got 49.7% of the vote. If you tallied up all the Democrats who ran for the Senate, they got 55% of the vote. Right. In the House, they got 55% of the vote. What happened to that 5% of Democratic vote that didn't, that didn't go, go for, Jack. for Jack? Well, Joe Kennedy knew that this feeling of anti-Catholicism was strong and it almost defeated his son. Right. I wish we had more time. Uh, thank you so much, David Nassau. The book is The Patriarch, The Remarkable Life and Turbulent Times of Joseph P. Kennedy. Thank you. We'll be back in a moment with a final word. There is so much toxic craziness coming out of the Trump administration that it's hard to keep your focus. One episode that got a great deal of attention was uncovered by the Washington Post. The Trump gang told officials at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that they could not use certain words or phrases in the documents they were compiling for the center's 2018 budget. Among the terms banned at the nation's top public health agency were fetus, transgender, vulnerable, diversity, and science-based. 
Donald Trump's minions didn't stop there. They offered some alternatives to the banned language. Instead of science-based, for example, the center's officials were urged to say, quote, the CDC bases its recommendations on science in consideration with community standards and wishes. Can you believe it? Science based on wishes. For those who don't know it, that is the stuff of totalitarianism. How do you work to stop the spread of tuberculosis, viral hepatitis, HIV and AIDS, or birth defects caused by the Zika virus if the people doing that work are barred from using terms like vulnerable or fetus or transgender or science-based? Once an uproar erupted, the Trump administration said this episode was mischaracterized. I don't think so. I trust the Post reporting. This is indeed a public health issue. It's much larger than the Centers for Disease Control. We should all be looking at the sickness that Donald Trump has brought to the very soul of this great country of ours. That's all for now. See you next time.